Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's webinar, where we will be talking about managing marketing after COVID-19. My name is Diego Valdez. I'm the director at the Sports Business Institute Barcelona. And for those of you that may not know what we do, we specialize in providing executive education for those that want to start, advance their career in the football industry, move into leadership positions in football. And tonight we have a very special guest. We have Marcus Bregleck, CMO at AS Monaco. And I just see that Marcus has connected now. So Marcus, hello, welcome. Hi, everybody. Hello, hi, Diego. I hope you can see and hear me okay. Yes, we can hear you, we can hear you uh, and see you perfectly fine, so that's great. Um, perfect, so then we can begin with our, our webinar tonight. As uh, you can see here, um, the webinar tonight is gonna be moderated by myself and our special guest, as I mentioned just now, Marcus from AS Monaco. In just a moment, we're gonna start our conversation, but before that, we wanna make sure that um, you guys can hear us. And we also know where you're connecting from. We want to know where you're connecting from. So um, in the chat box that you should see on the right-hand side, type in the country, the city where you're connecting from, and that'll tell us two things, that your sound is working, that you can hear us, and also, um, you know, we'd like to hear uh, where you guys are coming from. We like to do this to, um, you know, see where everybody's connecting from tonight. So we see Bo. Hi, Bo from the Netherlands. Excellent. From Manchester, we have uh, Max, Max Gantar, excellent. Right, Mo, hi Mo from Saudi Arabia. Nice to see you, Mo. So there's a, some familiar names of former former students at SBI. Okay, so it seems like the, the, the sound is working. Toronto, Brazil, Ukraine, India, Philippines. So Marcus, we have people from all over the world tonight. That sounds great. Welcome everybody, I'm really delighted to uh... To join you guys for the webinar and to, to basically almost kick this off as, a, as the next season of the collaboration with the Sports Business Institute, which has been um, a fun and, and really great ex experience in the past. So really happy to be here. Hi, everyone from uh, all around the world, as it seems. Yeah, we have people from, from all corners of the world, so that's great. Well, thanks, everybody, for engaging with us in the chat box. Um, I'll tell you briefly how we're going to structure tonight's webinar, which should last approximately an hour. So what we have prepared is a few questions already for Marcus, where we're going to talk about obviously the current situation with COVID-19. Uh, we want to know what's happening at football clubs and obviously hearing from someone's uh, experience such as Marcus is going to be very interesting. So we have a few questions that we've prepared for Marcus. Then what we're going to do is we're going to do a brief overview of our Masters in Football Business and Management, which is starting next month. And of course, Marcus plays a, an important role in that um, online master's degree. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And we'll, we're going to open the floor for your questions. So you guys that are connecting here from, from all over the world, you can have a chance to ask Marcus you know, your questions. So make sure you stay tuned until the end for that. Um, right, so Marcus, let's begin the conversation by, um, you know, for those of you that may not know about your trajectory, your background in the football industry, tell us a little bit more, uh, just briefly, as to what you're doing now at AS Monaco and uh, what you've done before in the industry. Yeah, I can, uh, I can start with the past, if you like. Um, so I would say football from, uh, from a number of dimensions has been pretty much the past. Um, so... I started in the sports industry on the football side, working for Adidas and for Nike for uh, a total of 11 years, um, working in different functions around, around football and advertising and digital marketing, a long time in sports marketing as well, athlete management, um, and then ended up being the, uh, the, the head of football for, for Nike for uh, the Northern European region um, until uh, 2006, I think it was. Um, so that was the first big long stint in football and then I moved um, outside of football but kind of stayed in football because I moved into the technology and the, and the digital industry mobile. So I used to work for Sony Mobile and HTC but also in that function one of the key elements of, of what I've done was uh, taking care of the uh, obviously the marketing and the brand management uh, of, of both of these entities but also their sports um, activities from a sponsorship partnership perspective. So uh, football was kind of back on the agenda, just from the other side of the table, if you want. Uh, then there was, a, there was a time where I was um, 
owning a, a small company with a partner of mine um, in asset management, um, and then moved from HTC to uh, to Liverpool Football Club, where I was the the CMO uh, in charge of marketing and media for uh, a little more than three and a half years. Um, interesting times from uh, you know not winning stuff for a long time at Liverpool Football Club to being uh, being part of um, let's say the back office team of, uh, of of a Champions League winner, which was a, an amazing ride and amazing experience, and then obviously Liverpool Football Club being, being very close to my heart. That was a an emotional period in many ways, so really good. And then um, after that time, this opportunity came up, um, very, very different to um, look at AS Monaco, a club that is um, basically undergoing a, quite a tremendous and interesting change journey at the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, well, we're going to talk about COVID anyway. Um, nobody needed this. <laughs> and when you're thinking about, um, you know, we're going to reset and uh, create a new change structure in a football club. COVID is the last I mentioned that you needed the whole in the big scheme of things, but we'll talk about that a little later. That's where I am today. I joined um, AS Monaco as the CMO for uh, in February. So six weeks for six weeks I was in in freedom and then I was boxed up in a <laughs> like we all were in a, in an apartment trying to work um, by my computer and uh, start things up there. So Interesting time, that's for sure. Fantastic. No, the great thing about your profile is that you really have a very holistic overview of the industry because you've been, as you said, you've worked for the brand side with Nike and Adidas. You've been, uh, you know, working in athlete representation when you had your, your agency. And, and obviously with uh, football clubs of great magnitude, such as uh, Liverpool Football Club and now um, your stint at um, AS Monaco, your current role. Um, so it's very interesting. And, uh, and for us, it's, of course, it's great to have you on board at SDI uh, as part of the master's degree because that, that perspective, that vision that you bring um, is very um, insightful for all our students. But we'll talk a little bit more about that as well as we move forward. Um, right, so let's begin the conversation. And um, you know, one of the reasons that we uh, entitled this webinar Managing Marketing During COVID is because Things are changing, things are evolving, and none of us expected this pandemic, evidently. But, um, you know, you're inside a football club now. Um, the competitions have restarted. So how are, clubs, how are football clubs adapting today, um, especially in the marketing department, um, during such a challenging period? Yeah, it was, it was, it was challenging indeed. Um, uh, to a certain degree, it, it still is, but we're coming out of it, and it's, things are starting to normalize again. But when it all started, obviously, Nobody had an idea to what magnitude um, this would this would drive us all. I wouldn't call it managing a football club through COVID. I would call it troubleshooting and juggling um, different things, different areas of the unknown, um, which was literally the case. There was no there was no experience in this field. There was no um, oh we've done this before. Oh do you remember? Uh, who can we call? There was just literally nothing. We were in a situation where we're going, all right, day by day. First question was, how long are we going to have um, competition? Which is obviously the most important question. How long will the ball be rolling? And I remember um, the, the day in March, uh, the, I think it was the 13th of March, where uh, everything went into a lockdown here in, in Monaco. And also the French League then later on decided to, to stop. Um, and with that, obviously, immediately from trying to look at a club in change mode and in reset mode, we have to look at a club in, uh, like, like many clubs, in you know, uh, proper crisis management mode. Um, and that was, that was very, very, um, very intense. So in terms of marketing, um, I think the first steps we did was to take stock and to say, okay, what is, it, what is the role of marketing in, in such a period? And very clear, uh, very quickly, it became very clear that the role of marketing was to show um, solidarity with the people that are holding up the system, um, how we can use uh, the power of, of the brand uh, to support um, the, the right causes. Uh, so it almost became a corporate social responsibility task, first and foremost, rather than in any way anything brand building or uh, promotional or classic marketing. So we had to completely rethink our our roles and our tasks at the time. And, and that was that was one of the challenges. Right, right. 
Yeah, I mean, it's been a, it's been a challenge and it's been uh, difficult times for, for all of us, of course, but, uh, but in sport in particular, which is the area where we're focusing on today, uh, this has definitely been, um, been a challenge. And, um, and uh, obviously in the French League, as you said, the, the competition was stopped. Others remained, like La Liga or the Premier League that, uh, that came back. Um, and this, of course, has created a lot of disruption. So, how are how you know just to, to build on what you were saying earlier? How how are football clubs now managing the relationship with their partners? Um, how much of a, of an importance does does digital come into play now? And in, in a moment now, where um, you know uh, the fans are not at the stadium and the activations are not happening uh, in the same way as before. So tell us a little bit about um, you know what you've experienced. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, from a commercial perspective, we we also had to rethink completely because um, the task all of a sudden was how do we deliver rights um, and uh, you know, partnership contracts at a time where there was no there was nobody running around the pitch. Um, so that was difficult. How do we deliver rights and how do we uh, keep our promises towards our partners when there is no broadcast? Um, how how do we uh, bring players closer uh, to the partners that have bought into us as, 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 as good partners when they were all around the world taking care of their families at the time, and that was clearly their priority. So it was, um, it was really intense. I, I remember speaking a lot with our, with our commercial team at the time, and they were extremely uh, busy and successful in, in keeping the partnerships afloat um, by you know, being ultimately, I think, being utterly human was important. Um, and actually, I have to say, our, our partners, and I hear this from a lot of my friends around the industry, um, partners were actually um, really understanding as well, because they also knew it was, not the, it was not the club's fault or anybody's fault that this was happening. It was the, a new situation. And I have to say, this is where really where partnerships showed how strong they were, because partners were supportive. They were not asking for rights that we couldn't deliver. They were not pushing for stuff that at that time was impossible, obviously knowing that we will do everything to deliver what the partners required. So that element of managing a partner where both sides don't get out of the partnership um, what they wanted and what they agreed to um, was, was a real challenge. So then it comes down to human interaction. It comes down to communication. It comes down to understanding um, the other side and learning what, what triggers them. And especially what is really important, and this is where my department then was touched to a big degree, was the digital side of things comes into play. And in a way, I mean, um, in, in many, like in many football clubs around the world and also in the French League, people went into uh, basically a, a reduced working time. Probably one of the only teams that worked all the way through and we even had to staff up in this time was the digital team because we had to keep um, content alive, um, storytelling alive to a certain degree. But as you all know, there's only so much historic football that, <laughs> that you can live, uh, that you can look at, and then at one point you need to rethink. So we have to get creative in that time as well. Yeah, so the digital weight or the, the pressure on the digital side of the business um, from a content perspective, a communications perspective um, was, uh, was intense. And I would say last but not least, and this to me was probably the, the most important point in this, um, was for us to immediately press the button and think forward and say, okay, well, we all, we all hope uh, that this will be over pretty soon and this will change in a, in a way pretty soon that the ball is rolling again. And luckily we're in that position today. But we have used the, um, I would say, around about one and a half to two months where it was really difficult um, to think forward, to talk about, well, let's use the opportunity to think about our, our strategy, what we want to do with the club, where do we want to take the club, how do we come out of this, does it change what we want to do, uh, do we need to adjust and adapt? Um, so we actually used the time and we hope we used the time in a, in a way that we now know very well what the what the path forward is and luckily the ball is rolling again and that all feels a little bit more normal now. Right now um, tell us a little bit more uh, about uh, you know the current situation in the French League because as, as far as I understand there there are some people that are allowed in the stadium is that correct and how much yeah. of an impact is this having? Yeah that, that's correct so uh, stadia are allowed to be too well I say this, and why I, while I say this, um, the numbers might just literally change. 
um, simply because um, the overall numbers from a COVID perspective in France, they don't look great at the moment. It's uh, unfortunately we're, we're in the middle of a, of a second wave. So same effects Monaco, obviously it affects the entire French league, but yeah, there was a, there was a test where clubs were allowed to bring a certain amount of people up to 5,000 into the stadium. Um, some clubs like, for example, in the very, in, a, in an earlier game, Nice decided um, not to do, not to allow spectators in, even though they were technically legally allowed to do so. Um, we allowed for a smaller number of spectators to, to come in. Um, obviously, under the social distancing rules, um, there's a big health and safety protocol. So um, I have to say our, um, our, our facilities and, and stadium operations team have done a tremendous job in, in, in making this happen and making it happen safely. Um, it is, Monaco is a slightly smaller stadium, so I think it's, it's quite well controllable there. Um, yeah, but, and that will remain the challenge, I think, for the next weeks and months. How do you orchestrate a stadium experience so that it's safe? But it's not necessarily what's in the stadium, it's the way to the stadium and the way away from the stadium that is that is sometimes even more challenging. Um, within the stadium, it's actually it's actually manageable with a, with a smaller amount of people. Uh, it's more how do people um, get there from a logistical perspective and then leave again without um, w without get, getting into into danger. Um, yeah, so th there's those kind of um, operational uh, elements that we have to look at in, in every detail you can possibly imagine. Um, the same goes for team travel. How does the team how does the team behave? How do how the you know football teams there? There's many people on a fairly confined space, and they're together all the time. And um, so that's also something we have to completely um, rethink in our in our training center as well. How do we operate a system that um, that that allows the football team to uh, to train in in times like this? So interesting times for sure. Right. Now, um, you know, you talked about uh, thinking forward, and um, obviously the, the coronavirus has brought upon uh, lots of challenges, um, but uh, perhaps there are some opportunities. So how, how does a football club move forward? I mean, um, how do you look ahead and, uh, you know, look to bring on new partners and uh, continue operations as, as, as best you can? So tell us a little bit about how, how you're living this uh, day to day as well. I mean, what we literally did was we said, okay, let's let's use the time, build a strategy, create a plan for the future, um, under the assumption that we will live with Corona for for a little bit longer. It will not immediately go away. That's probably clear for everyone. It's just a question on how do we how do we operate as a football club. Interesting enough, the system of football, as I've experienced it over the over the many years has been fairly constant. And even now, as football is slowly, surely, slowly but surely bouncing back, the old mechanisms start to start to uh, start to work again fairly, fairly quickly. Um, everybody said the uh, the transfer market is going to completely drop into into something that we've never seen before. Well, so far, that has only happened in certain areas, um, but not really, not really tremendously. Um, Partnerships have even come to fruition during the COVID period. So clubs have even managed to create partnerships during the COVID period because people are a convinced about the fact that that football will prevail. Um, and and realistically, we have to say we're lucky to be in football because of the uh, the followership, the size and power of the industry, and the fact that um, th that the reason that football is protected is obviously a, a problem for other sports um, because you know potential partners they're they're very much looking at football right now which is great for us in the industry but other sports are suffering but in in football we still have seen similar interests we still have seen the, the same mechanisms but at the same time we have to we have to rethink as to what the strategic priorities are in the future how do we how do we reshape um, the organization during the COVID period we were actually um, building uh, physical structures like a new training camp and a new performance center. You, you can imagine that all of that stopped as well. So we, we had two monstrous construction areas that were supposed to be ready. They, they couldn't be finished in time. That has an impact. 
So looking forward is obviously one finishing or continuing the, the business as usual plan that was that was there before because it was it, it's not wrong today. But then at the same time, making sure that um, we use the time to really focus, refocus, and reshape um, our our plan and strategy for the future. Right. Now, uh, just to, to say on that point with uh, with partnerships, do you find that uh, they are uh, becoming different than they were before? In other words, are the contracts uh, shorter? Is the economic value less in this current time? So what are you noticing are the trends in the market now? Yeah, no, de definitely the points that you made, it's, it's, that is the case. Um, con contract structures change to a certain degree. Um, there is a little more, uh, I would say there's a couple of more safety nets that are packed into these contracts, um, potentially potentially on both sides. But um, yeah, there is, and, and also there is a time where foot, where as clubs and rights holders, we now have to pay back a little bit and still we're in debt from a, from a rights delivery perspective because obviously we couldn't do that when the ball was not rolling. Um, and th that's an element. So there, there, there's contracts about how rights have to deliver now in a shorter space of time. Um, is that the same efficiency and effectiveness when you almost overload partners with their rights that should have been delivered a, a few months ago? Um, so all of a sudden partners go like, well, what do I do with all this? Um, all of a sudden we, we don't even have the capability to activate that much as we want it. Uh, because maybe they don't have the capacity at the moment. So it, it's also it's looking at the own rights delivery, but it's only it's also about looking at what the partner is capable of doing at this moment in time. Because these these um, you know these businesses these partners currently might have different priorities than uh, activating a football partnership. So one of the tasks is obviously to give um, partners almost turnkey solutions. And those are mostly digital at the moment. Uh, turnkey solutions to say, we're gonna package up certain elements of content. All you need to do is launch it in your, in your social media accounts. Uh, we'll help you with the activation. We'll help you with ideation and ideas generation because you might not have the time or the mindset at the moment. So um, yeah, it has changed for sure. Right, right. Interesting. Um, and then the other thing that we wanted to touch upon was you know, the professionals, what we've called the professionals of tomorrow. I mean, a lot of the people that are listening to this webinar, I'm sure, are people that are either looking to transition into the football industry or looking to start or build a career in, in the football industry. And um, you mentioned before that, uh, you know, one of the areas where you guys staffed up was, was digital. So can you tell us, um, and this perhaps we can tie in as well with the collaboration that you're forming part of the, of the master's program that we run at SBI. So what do you think are the key I guess the key competencies, the key skills that you know those professionals looking to transition or move into the, the football industry need to they need to have um, from your perspective and obviously from from a hiring perspective as well as, as someone like yourself inside a football club. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean the the digital the digital element today is not a it's it's not a skill anymore. It's almost a hygiene factor. Um, for the next generation of, of football executives um, or individuals moving into the football industry, an understanding of, of how the world operates, i.e. In, in a digital only type of way, even a poster is digital today because it will have a barcode. So everything is, everything is digital. Um, so that's almost a hygiene factor. It's not a differentiator anymore to have digital skills these days. It is how you use um, how you use the combination of knowledge of the industry coming from programs like this where, where you know students get the opportunity to talk to industry experts across um, across various uh, fields of play which is really good to get that that wide look at it um, it's that gaining that ex experience it is then looking at um, you know, a, a versatile field of play and potentially um, investing time into, I always make a little bit of a proposal to say, try and invest into internships, uh, try and invest some time into internships to what I always like to call, you have the longest interview possible. You might be in an interview for six months, but that's a real advantage because somebody can really work with you closely as a, as a you know, newcomer maybe in the industry, but but you show that you're open, that you have transferable skills, um, and to get in is a, is a 
via internships is a really good way. Um, but then, you know, as, as you said, the digital is, is the, the digital world is the base. Um, and then it's a little bit figuring out what is that nugget within the football world that is the passion point. Um, I, I'm personally, I'm a firm, firm believer that people will be best when they found their, found their passion in a certain industry. Um, is it the athlete management side of things? Is it stadium operation? Is it at a club? Is it at an agency? Is it at a, a you know, at, at a commercial partner in the sponsor, sponsorship space? So to be very clear in the beginning um, where you ultimately want to land and then be open to look at various things in a flexible way to say, okay, if you invest into, a, for example, six months internships, well, it, it's useful to look at different departments in that time um, to, to, you know, agree with, uh, with maybe the club that you're working for to say, okay, I want to maneuver through two or three different departments so I can get a big picture. And that, that I would say equips people really well. So the combination of good education, um, the digital world as a basis, um, along with activity and uh, an ultra long interview of six months as an internship, that, com that combination um, I, I know has uh, landed many jobs for people in our department, um, but also for uh, at my previous club and in the football world in general. Okay, oh, very interesting, um, which of course we're going to touch upon some of those points uh, a little bit further ahead as we, we continue with our discussion. Okay, great. Well, um, those are some of the points that we had prepared and wanted to discuss with Marcus. Um, at this point, what uh, you can do is you can start thinking about some questions, write them in the chat box, and in just a moment we're going to ask uh, Marcus your questions. In the meantime, while you're thinking about your questions and putting them in the chat box, we wanted to inform you about our online master in football business management that starts next month. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Marcus plays an important role in this master's program because not only is he a lecturer and guest speaker, but he's also um, a, um, a tutor, he's a mentor. So he works with uh, students very closely throughout the year. Um, and um, obviously that's one of the reasons why we're uh, delighted to, to be working again with, with Marcus, with um, his expertise in the football industry. Now, briefly, what does this master do? Or what is the objective? Well, the aim is to equip you with the formal skills and knowledge and competencies to prepare you for a role in the football industry, whether it is a, an entry-level role uh, for those that are younger and are looking to you know, break into the industry, or a leadership role for those that come from another sector or that have already worked in the football industry and want to take their career to the next level. Well, this program is designed for all those profiles because at the end of the day, what we look to do is we bring the experts, we bring the people that do this day in, day out. And here you can just see a few of the guest speakers that uh, we're going to be uh, introducing this year for the master's program. Obviously, as I mentioned, Marcus. Marcus is not only a, a speaker, but he also um, is part of the tutorial sessions, is a mentor. So his role in the master's program is, is quite important and prominent. But we also have people um, that, are, that have worked at, um, you know, very important clubs like Rich Lamb, uh, having worked in sponsorship roles for Manchester United, Inter Milan, West Ham United, somebody like Ornella, who is head of professional football at, at FIFA. I always pointed to this master class that she did with us last year because, uh, as some of you may know, the regulations for agents are changing and they're evolving as we speak. And last year, when we brought Ornella into the master class, um, essentially, she was telling us what those reforms were going to be. So you were hearing it from the people that were designing the new regulations, such as um, Ornella herself at FIFA. Then we have people like Julie Ferre, who's worked at FC Barcelona, also was part of um, the team at Monaco before. Esther, working for events for the World Cup uh, for FIFA or UEFA. You know, we have a lot of people that uh, have uh, a wealth of knowledge and experience. And as you'll see, it's people that do things day in, day out in football, whether it's for a club, for a governing body, for an agency, um, for a representation firm. You know, we wanted to bring in not just people from clubs, but from all of the industry, because it is important to look at it from the prism of the brand, of the clubs, of the governing body, of, um, you know, the new players that come into the industry. So um, we bring in people like Amir Somoji, who is a consultant based in Brazil. Um, CEO of Sports Value, Male Coido, um, player representative and FIFA, um, sorry, FA registered intermediary, Christian Martin. So the list goes on. You see the people that have worked for Manchester City, 
um, others that have uh, worked in agencies. So the idea here is, like I said before, bring in the experts, bring in the people that do this day in, day out, so that you learn and you build um, you know, the expertise from, from people working in the industry. The other thing that we really focus on is networking. So we believe that the master's program, yes, part of it is the content, the knowledge, the skills that you're going to learn, but the big, big element that comes uh, to light here is the community that you build and the networks that you nurture when you form part of this, uh, this master's program. Just to give you an example as to who we have and the family that we like to call the SBI family. You know, last time we checked, we were over 100 countries of students that have done our courses in the past eight years that we've been in operation. So you see the map there and uh, you know, a lot of yellow dots across the map. And that just goes to show that um, you know, we have a wide community of both students and alumni, which plays a big role. A lot of them have gone on to work and are currently working at clubs, federations, organizations such as the ones you see here on screen. Um, and we also, um, you know, the, the program tends to attract a wide array of profiles. And, and Marcus can attest to this. Last year we had a few professional football players on the course. This is a picture of Wes Morgan from Leicester City, who was part of the cohort a couple of years ago. So there you see when he came and visited us in, in, in Barcelona. And, and Marcus, last year, if you recall, we had a, we had a couple of um, professional players in the cohort, right? So tell us a little bit about how this also helps in the interaction when you have you know, people that come from the industry, players, people from other sectors, and, and those that are starting out. So what was your experience like last year when you were you know, form, forming part of the, of the Masters? Yeah, I mean, it, it, this was great because um, they obviously brought in a little bit of a perspective of the, of the football side in, in clubs. And something that is still happening in football clubs a lot is that divide between the football side and the non-football side. And it's interesting when people transcend um, and they and they start to understand more what's behind the non-football side. It's pretty clear what the uh, what the football side does, but sometimes it's not so clear what the business behind is doing. And then when you hear from some of the guys, Trudini was part of it. Um, you know, you hear some of the guys that actually start to dig a little bit deeper into what it takes to run a football club. Um, what, what it takes to make sure that the operations on the football side is, is working, but what does it also take to make sure that the, the commercial, the brand side is, is, uh, is forming the base um, for, for long-term brand building as well. Um, all these things are, are interesting. And then to, to get the perspective from professional, from pro professional players, how they see it while they're playing, how far this is sometimes away from them and how important it is for the non-football side or the business side of the football club um, to, I wouldn't say prove the value, but sometimes explain the value a little better within. Um, and, uh, you know, this was the case in both of the clubs that I have worked in or, or I'm still working in. There is always a little bit of work to do to make sure that these, these two worlds come closer together because one can't live without the other, um, that's for sure. And, and ultimately, these two worlds world need, to, need to sync. And it's, it's interestingly enough, when you look at what are the most successful clubs, it's usually those clubs where these two worlds are nicely in sync and working, working together. There's always, you know, there's bumps, there's hurdles, there's tooling problems, stuff like that. But ultimately, um, where, where these two ent uh, parts of the, of the entities sink in and follow a, a certain direction, that's why the point of clear club strategy and clear plan is really important. Um, where those two things come together, there is usually success also when there is no success on the pitch because there might be three, four years where there's just no success whatsoever. And then sometimes a strong business and a strong brand can carry um, can carry a club through such a time as well. Um, this was literally the case in my previous club at Liverpool Football Club. We didn't, we didn't win for a long time. I mean, between 2005 and 2019, that was a for for Liverpool fans, it was long years of, of, of very little. And um, and but still, the Liverpool brand prevailed. The history was celebrated. The uh, uh, the depth of the brand came across and carried the club until. Um, the victories came back, and, and obviously that's a, that's an important piece. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. You mentioned Troy Deeney from from Watford. I was having a conversation with him as he finished the program, and uh, one of the the things he said is it, it's opened my eyes because I've learned a lot about the business side, and, and as you said, sometimes the business side and the sporting side don't always coexist as as well as they should in some uh, in some cases, and uh, 
his uh, his feedback was, you know, I've really learned a lot about the industry that I'm in that I've been involved in for many years, but now I understand it from a whole different prism. So, uh, so we're, just to let you know, uh, we are speaking to a few professional footballers uh, as we speak, and we expect to have uh, a couple of them join the program shortly. So we will be announcing uh, uh, in the next uh, weeks probably uh, a couple of names that uh, that perhaps some of you may recognize professional footballers that are looking to join our... Oh, so that's, is that why Messi wasn't sure about prolonging in Barcelona? Is that, <laughs> understand. Yeah, yeah, it looks like uh, he wanted to take a bit of a hiatus to come and, uh, and learn with us, but uh, <laughs> now he's back uh, on the field, so maybe yeah. another year. <laughs> <laughs> right, now, um, just moving on here, and, uh, and we'll get to your questions in just a moment, but I, I do want to talk about this area of the master's program, which is in fact where Marcus plays a very important role, which is mentorship and guidance. One of the things that we did when we designed this master's program is we didn't just want to offer our students, like I mentioned before, the knowledge and even the contacts. We wanted to be there to guide them because let's face it, it can be challenging for somebody that's looking to break in or move into a leadership position in football and they don't necessarily know which route to take. So our mentorship program has been designed specifically to look at your personal objectives, aspirations, but also identify those gaps that you may have, and with our team of tutors and mentors, work to optimize those opportunities. Now, of course, Marcus worked very closely with um, our students last year in helping them, and uh, Marcus, perhaps you can touch upon this as well, the mentorship side of the program, and how, um, how did you experience it working with our students? And uh, you know, many of them uh, have gone on to whether they've started their own projects or, or somebody that just uh, contacted us last week who got uh, the, the role of the managing director of a club in the Netherlands in the second division. So you know, people like that that move in and, and, and are able to benefit from that. So what was your experience working as a mentor last year, Marcus? I think that's that's a, the, one of the really interesting parts of the program. Um, there is obviously the the part of the program that is the master class where you get a, a lot of a lot of information where you where you really dig deep on certain topics um, by by the experts you mentioned. But then there's this element of the as you call them the lab sessions, and and I thought they were really useful. Um, they, those are usually sessions where we have more of a guided conversation around certain topics um, and then working with the with the different students and then you know taking different perspectives also the, the geographical differences are really interesting because you get you get influences from from Brazil um, we were talking about uh, the US we were talking about Canada we were, it, it, it was Africa, I remember, um, it was really a very diverse, diverse group and it brings in a whole, you know, array of perspectives. So those lab sessions around certain topics um, and then working on certain topics together were really useful. And then last but not least, there was the, um, yeah, as you call it, the, the, the mentorship element of the course, which which I thought was was great. I hope it was useful for, for the students. It was very much having conversations around what they specifically aspire to. What are their what are their strengths? What are the passion points? Um, where do they want to go? What are the ideas? How do they potentially go about it? Um, what's a, what's a good way in? Um, questions like oh, as I mentioned before, should I invest another six months in an internship? Should I not do that? Um, how do I do it? Um, if I have the following three skills and I'm missing the fourth, how do I get to that? Um, so I, I have to say those those calls were really were interesting, uh, really interesting to learn about you know the aspirations of, of the students and then hopefully help them with a with a few you know pieces of guidance as to um, how they can how they can tackle it. So yeah, no, I read in the in the group that we that we have that actually um, there's quite some successes from that uh, from that group. So that's very positive. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, uh, for those of you listening in, it's, it's not every day. I mean, obviously here we're, we're very lucky that we have this interaction and this uh, accessibility to, to speak with Marcus, but um, those of you who may be listening, it's, it's not every day. It's not every day that you have access to the former CMO of uh, Marketing and Media of Liverpool FC, current CMO at A's Monaco, these types of roles um, to actually guide you and help you and mentor you. It's um, it is a unique opportunity, so we are uh, we are very thankful and we're very glad that we have this collaboration with Marcus because 
it goes a long way. I know he mentioned and he said hopefully it helped our students and uh, and I mean uh, that's uh, that's uh, something that uh, Marcus for your feedback. Uh, everybody that uh, did mentorship sessions with you, um, you know, found them really valuable because, because um, you know, it's not every day that they have access to, to have conversations with um, people of, um, you know, expertise like yourself that has worked with, um, you know, different parts of the industry. So that's something to, to think about uh, for those listening in if um, you're thinking about, uh, you know, where you can get a mentor, this program offers that. Um, I won't go into it too much because we do want to get to your questions in just a moment, but we do help you with your career guidance. We map out a career plan based on your own aspirations. We help you brand yourself. We help you get out there in the market to cater and leverage your strengths and also build on your previous experience. And evidently, we put you in touch with the relationships that we have built over the years so that you have an opportunity to optimize um, your career um, advancement in football. Now, lastly, um, the elements that we've uh, incorporated last year and this year as well is we have uh, built partnerships with organizations in order for you to, to have an opportunity to have what we call a virtual internship. So some of the you know, companies that we collaborate in football, you see them on screen here. There's a couple of agencies. There's a consulting firm. And what they do is they commission projects to us. And then the students of the master's program have to deliver those projects uh, as if they were working in those companies. And now today we've seen that um, in the COVID days, how easy it is to actually have web conferences, meetings, and get results done uh, in an online environment. So what these companies have done is based on the relationship they have with us at SBI, they commission projects to us, our students work with them, um, and then at the end of the degree, not only do you have a master's degree that you can say that you've done throughout the year, but you will be able to put on your CV that you've collaborated with one of these companies on a business project. And that goes a long way as well, because especially for those that don't have a lot of experience, to be able to say that you've already worked on a project specific to the football industry, you know, it's something that it'll add to your CV um, at the end of the program. Finally, at the, at the uh, conclusion, we have two days in Barcelona. Uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed so that June next year, everybody can come here and we go inside FC Barcelona, we go to Espanol, we go to Media Pro, and we have a nice all around um, two day networking event and graduation ceremony. So there you see a picture from uh, the group from a year ago or a couple of years ago. Right, so we'll get to your questions now. Um, in case you do want to learn more about the master's program that uh, I mentioned before, you can go to our website at sbibarcelona.com. There's the Master in Football Business and Management. You can look at the information on the website, and obviously you can get in touch with our team. Finally, before we get to your questions, we've prepared a gift for you uh, listening into the webinar. What we did is uh, a couple of weeks ago, we got in touch with Marcus and we said, Marcus, we want to ask you a few questions. We want to get your insight uh, into the business side of football. And uh, what he did is he came back to us with uh, a few tips. And we've turned it into an ebook or a PDF, if you will. Um, so those of you listening in, what we're going to do is we're going to share the link so that you can download it um, and you'll have access to that. We'll, we're going to make it accessible to our wider community a little bit later, but you'll, you'll have first access tonight. So I'll put it in the chat box in just a minute. There's the link if you want to copy that. But I'll put it in the chat box so you can download that as a gift to, uh, to you guys for listening into the webinar tonight. Right, so that's the master's program. Let's get to your questions, whether you want to talk about anything that Mark has brought up today or you want to learn more about the master's program. So let's, let's go back here. I see that there's quite a few coming in. So let me just go back to the chat and see. We have a question here from William Slack. So let me read that question. So one second. So he says, what KPIs do football clubs work towards in digital? Is the goal interactivity of fans, such as on social, or is it deeper and more focused on fans and revenue, essentially fans as consumers? So I guess if you can summarize to us, what are those KPIs from, from a digital standpoint? I mean, football clubs are growing up to, uh, to serious digital businesses, and therefore they have very similar KPIs to those. So there is the awareness KPI, there is 
the KPI, well, the most important one um, that, that we measure is obviously the KPI of engagement. How close do we get into a dialogue with our fans rather than into just display marketing and promotional elements? How can we really ask people, trigger people to do something? So um, whether it's user-generated content, whether it's uh, you know, you know shares and stuff like that. So the the the, the main uh, focus at the moment is obviously the, the engagement trigger, but then um, there's obviously the the data side of things. How do football clubs um, create a community that is um, filled with with rich and executable data? That's not only valuable for the football club but also for partners. So to what degree do football clubs get consent? From uh, from the audience to you know to promote partner uh, partner promotions or partner opportunities as well. So those are kind of the the main KPIs. Uh, take all of that aside. The main KPI of a football club is to score one goal more than the other team. Uh, and that's it, it. Sounds like it sounds a bit weird, but when you go and work for a football club, only then you realize how important it is emotionally on a, on a Monday morning that the, the team has won. Uh, that element is not something we can underestimate. So besides the hard numbers, um, there's the, uh, the emotional who human factor in a football club um, that, is, that is important. Right, okay, fantastic. Uh, we have another question here from Rana. He says, at this point in time, when the fans are not coming into the stadium, how are you managing fan engagement? Um, sorry, the question just disappeared on me, but uh, I guess about fan engagement. And he says, is it more than, is it more than earlier? Is, it there, is there any conscious attempt at personalization? Um, are you doing it alone or with partners? So um, fan engagement now that uh, there's limited uh, fans or no fans in stadium. Yeah, so uh, as we talked about before, the, the digital, the digital uh, area is the answer. I would not know how football clubs would have survived this period without, without the digital space. How would fan connections and dialogue have happened if we didn't have the opportunity to go through mobile? Uh, we, we reshaped, um, in our case, we reshaped, and also I can speak for my former club, we reshaped the, uh, the, basically the organization to a very content-led we, we call it um, content factory. So it's all about creating interesting content, getting people as close as possible um, to the athletes, um, allowing them in, open, opening the doors um, to, to show what's, what's really behind, um, come up with surprising stories, um, sometimes stuff that is, that, that is un unbelievably um, surprising or elements uh, in, the, in the CSR world where some of our players are when we really went out of their way to support the system relevant people that were helping in the um, uh, during the COVID period. So um, it's telling stories about these it's telling stories about these kind of um, these kind of times. And when we look back, I'm sure when we look back in one or two years and we look back at the content that we've produced now, it will have been fundamentally different to what football will be producing in the future. It's it's a uh, it's very unique. So putting content at the heart and making sure we, we keep a dialogue going uh, with mobile at the center was one element. The other element was also uh, we had a big, or we still have a big successful esports team. And that obviously didn't stop during COVID and connecting with youth by, uh, by our esports team was another part of the strategy. Right, okay, interesting. Now there's another question which is uh, which has come up here from Mohammed Kadri. Hi Mohammed, nice to see you. First off, he says, Thank you very much to, to both of us for the session. Well, thank you for being here, Mohammed. Now, he wanted to ask about broadcasting rights because one of the things that we obviously saw was that the French League, they called off the league as opposed to some of the other competitions. So what was the broadcasting um, scenario like with the, with the broadcasters in the sense that were they compensated? How, how are you seeing that having an impact now? Yeah, it was very difficult. The French league was obviously one one of the few leagues um, next to the Belgium league and you know a couple of others worldwide, but maybe smaller leagues. But the French league was the one of the big leagues that actually really decided, okay, we're going to stop this. From a broadcasting rights perspective, that was difficult um, because what you do immediately when you just do, you make such a decision, you basically uh, yeah you kiss goodbye quite a 
quite a substantial amount of revenue from a broadcasting perspective. I mean, it was all over media. I'm not telling any secrets. It was round about 350 million euros that were simply lost in in space because um, the product didn't exist anymore for for a period of time. And obviously, the broadcasters then didn't have any obligation to pay that, um, rightly so. Um, so that was really a, a pure and simple economic impact right there off the bat. Um, the way it was mainly managed, it's, you know, it was managed, luckily, there was already a new media deal in place for the French, for the French League, which gave the security for the future. Um, and it was clear that there is substance and security. And because of that substance and security, it was easy for, easier for clubs to get uh, government support and, and loans um, in order to bridge, bridge the gap until, until the football season starts again started again. So that, that was kind of, in many ways, that was the, the principle um, on how it worked in the French League. And uh, yeah, that's how the clubs, how many clubs like, actually survived. Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, good. Um, right, there's somebody here, Romani. Omari says, what books should I read and resources to uh, increase my football knowledge? Well, there's two that I would recommend. One is Done Deal by Daniel G. The other is Show Me the Money by Estere Calzada, if you want to have a look at those. Marcus, I don't know if you have any books that you wanted to recommend. Um, I probably, I, it's not really a football book, but it's one that um, depicts the mindset of a, a great leader in the sports world. I would recommend Shoe Dog from, from Nike. Oh, great one. Um, so, yeah, Phil Knight. Um, it, it's not all football stories, obviously, but it just, you know, we want to talk about mindset in the sports world and what it takes to win in the sport environment. That's a pretty impressive book. A hundred percent. Loved it. And I couldn't put it down. So if you want a, a good book, uh, not just about football, but business-wise, uh, Shoe Dog, as Marcus says, by, by Phil Knight. Okay, good. So maybe we'll take a couple more questions. Uh, Pedro Tutivan says, hi, everyone. I hope you're well. My question is, if you were able to retake a class or certification program to allow you to sharpen your skills, which one you, would you recommend? Well, you know, uh, it's an easy choice, Pedro. It's the SBI course, of course. Um, but no, obviously, there's great programs out in the market. What I would recommend to you, Pedro, is do the research, see what's out there, um, and make sure that it's for you. I mean, some of the programs have more face-to-face -face components. Some of them are more online. Some of them are more executive. Some of them are, you know, more hours. So. Probably it's best to, to do the research and see what's out there in the market. Look at your budget as well. Our program is uh, 6,500 euros, which is you know, uh, competitively priced with some of the others in the market. So uh, that's something that I would say, uh, but, uh, but evidently we have, uh, we have a, a, a very strong uh, conviction that the master's program that we deliver offers results. So if you want to learn more about it, just get in touch with us. Um, so great. Um, okay, let me just see here. By the way, I've posted the book um, the ebook that we just mentioned about uh, the insights. So you should see that in the chat box. Um, and then somebody here, Sebastian. Hi, Sebastian. He says, I'm working in an amateur club with many sports, 27, I guess 27 sports. Um, just lost that question as a new one came in, so sorry. Uh, uh, let me try and get back to it. Yes, what future do you imagine for that type of institutions in marketing? So uh, amateur clubs, um, obviously they're struggling as well. So what do you see as the future for them uh, from a marketing standpoint? Um, first of all, they're on the one hand they're they're struggling like all all clubs, especially amateur clubs across all sports around the world at the moment. It's really really difficult for these clubs because uh, they largely rely on on spectator revenues in many cases, depending on what level the club plays. Um, but that is that is a, a serious income um, that is you know, obviously there's most of the time there's no media rights involved so therefore uh, these clubs are are struggling. Um, what future? I think amateur sport has a huge huge importance in not only delivering talent but uh, making sure that society stays stays mobile and active. Um, from that perspective, I think amateur sports will always. Um, you know, be holding up the flag and, and will be a really important component for professional sports as well um, to have that connection and that interaction. I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's almost a basis that is really difficult, uh, that really has a difficult time right now. And that, I, in my opinion, there should be a better, uh, more significant solidarity model where 
um, professional sports should go out of their way a little bit more to support um, amateur sports because it's hugely important. Um, that those, and, but from a marketing perspective, it is the only thing you can probably say at the moment is hopefully these clubs were properly managed that there's a little bit of a financial um, backbone to go through this time. And then when the spectators come back, um, it will it will come back to somewhat normal. It's it's really difficult. It's hard to say at the moment. I'm, I'm going to be honest. Right, right, right. Okay, good. So let's take the last question, and with this we will be, we will begin to wrap up. So we uh, finish off on the hour as we as we wanted to. So let me just have a look here uh, for that last question. Um, okay, this is a good one, and maybe we can wrap it up with this one from Grecia, Grecia Catalan. Grecia, nice to see you. Grecia is based in. In Ohio, and she did a course with us a little bit earlier on in the year. And she says, "What advice would you give your younger self with regards to entering the sports industry?" So, uh, one well, a good one to finish off there, uh, Marcus. What advice would you give to, to yourself, and I guess to everybody listening uh, tonight? Yeah, I think um, pick the right pick the right education. And um, I'm not saying this because I'm on this call, but but the, the flexibility and the variety of this course is, is really great. Pick the right basis of education. The second one is um, go after that part uh, of the football world that you're really passionate about. So that's the, the passion element. And the last point is don't be shy to invest, um, as I mentioned earlier, in the longest interview there is, which is an internship, and show on the ground what you can do. In, there's so many cases in my past where where we, uh, we we took over interns right away because they were just too good to let go. And on that note, uh, one of the students last year uh, that mentioned to us, and this Marcus, maybe uh, you haven't heard directly, but uh, Michelle from last year uh, was very grateful because the advice that Marcus gave to her. Um, this is a student that came from another sector that was looking to get into the football industry in Brazil. She had some contacts. She wanted to leverage that, and she was starting a company. And uh, the advice that Marcus gave was do some pro bono work. Go out there, do pro bono work for football clubs, and uh, whether it's an internship or pro bono work, or um, I think somebody on the, on the call as well was asking as to how to approach football clubs to pitch a particular service. Um, so all of that uh, can go a long way uh, if you do something uh, thinking long term and not uh, you know right away as to getting the result because that will come later on but investing in the long term game is is a good way to put it so with that we can we can wrap um, wrap up the the questions for tonight um, we are very glad to have all of you here connecting we like to call it our SBI family whether you've done a course with us whether you're thinking about doing a course with us or whether you just come for the webinars. You are part of our family and uh, we want to keep you engaged and we want to keep providing value to you. So an hour of your time is very valuable. We thank you for having spent it with us tonight. Um, if you want to learn more about the master's program, get in touch with our team. You see our email address is there. Um, I'm very happy to engage with all of you. There's my email if you want to contact me directly or some of our other team members at SBI. And you have our website there. So the last thing to say is, Thank you, Marcus. We're looking forward to working with you another year. It's, uh, it's been an engaging hour uh, with our community tonight. Uh, any final words on your end uh, to, to finish off uh, the webinar? M much, much appreciated. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, yeah, can't, can't wait. I hope to see uh, many of you in, in one of our video sessions. And no, really, really looking forward to it. And uh, let's all hope football went through the the, the deepest value of this already and we're only going upwards yes let's hope so that'll be um, what we will all aspire to so thanks once again marcus for sharing your insight with us thanks to all of you for listening in and if you want more information on our master's program you know where to reach us we'll be there to answer your questions and help you to make the best decision for your future so thanks once again everybody all the best and take care all the best take care bye-bye bye everybody